Welcome everybody to our uh, live Theory Labs uh, 2020 lecture today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Alan Hamaker as our uh, speaker for today. Um, the uh, lecture today is part of Live Theory Lab 2020, a series of 10 lectures, um, which now is the second to last lecture of the series. Um, as usual, uh, this is part of the uh, International Max Planck Research School Live uh, of the educational program. Um, and as a good tradition in life, um, we have uh, two special things. On the one hand, we have our uh, fellows, uh, two of them uh, you can now see on the on the webcam, uh, Janik Oshek and Lisa Reiber. Uh, and as usual, um, one of the fellows will introduce our speaker uh, for today. Uh, and in the end, after the presentation, we have uh, some time for question and answers, but also here we have the tradition uh, that it's uh, fellows first. So we would like uh, to open the floor with questions by our fellows uh, before we open uh, for the remaining audience uh, to ask for any questions. The session today, again, is recorded, uh, so I would like to ask all of you uh, who do not want to appear on the final recording, uh, which might be available on our YouTube channel later, um, to shut off the webcam and the microphone throughout the whole session. Uh, otherwise, uh, I wish you all a very interesting and um, very inspiring lecture, which we are very much looking forward to. And now I would like to ask uh, Yannick to introduce Alan. Okay, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Alan Hamaker from Utrecht University. Um, Professor Hamaker received both her bachelor's and master's degree in psychology from Utrecht University and her PhD on time series analysis from the University of Amsterdam. After a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Virginia, she accepted a position as professor in methodology and statistics at the Utrecht University. There, she also founded the Dynamic Modeling Lab, which developed statistical tools for longitudinal data analysis. Her current research interests closely overlap with the general objectives of the LIFE program, which is to study systematic change in human behavior over time. Professor Hamaker has performed expertise in time series analysis longitudinal data analysis, multi-level analysis, and structured equation modeling, as well as Bayesian statistics. Among her most influential works are the random intercept cross leg panel model and the dynamic structure equation modeling framework for the analysis of um, intensive longitudinal data. And the topic of today's talk will be choices in design and analysis to study change. And I'm looking forward to the presentation. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and also for having me as one of the speakers in this very interesting series of talks. Um, so I was asked to talk about uh, methodological choices um, in, in uh, studying change and development. And um, so I've constructed my talk around a number of questions that easily come to mind when you have to think about these kind of things. Um, but before I actually dive into this, I would first like to set the stage of what is important in empirical research. And for this, we will be looking at uh, three uh, key components of empirical research. That's the research goal. So what are we actually interested in, um, how we measure it, and how we analyze the data. And to focus on the research goal first, uh, we can make a distinction, for instance, between um, uh, goals that are more about confirmatory or um, theory-driven research versus exploratory or data-driven research. Another distinction that can be made is between description, prediction, and causation. And that's what I want to elaborate on here. So when we think about description, you can think of research questions such as, do adolescents who use more social media tend to feel more lonely? or what percentage of adolescents use social media daily. So these are uh, descriptives of, of a certain characteristic of a population, correlations or relationship between two variables or proportion in the, in the population. Description can also be about a particular individual. So what proportion of days does Lucy use social media? But each time it's just a descriptive uh, characteristic of a person or a population. When we move to prediction, we can think of questions such as, are adolescents who use social media uh, at a daily basis 
at risk for mental illness. So here it really is about something that predicts something else. So it's, it's no longer just a correlation, it's really there's a direction in this relationship. Another question would be, does Arnold, so at the individual level, does Arnold feel more lonely after he has been on social media? And the third category is about causation. So now we have questions such as, does loneliness lead to or result in more social media use? So now it's not only a direction anymore, it's really about one thing causing something else. So a change here results in a change somewhere else. And this, of course, can also be at the individual level. So does social media use put Sue at risk for mental illness? Um, we were interested in, in finding out more about uh, to what extent developmental researchers are driven by these different kinds of goals. And to this end, we uh, evaluated 100 empirical studies from the Consortium on Individual Development, or referred to as SIT, which is a very large 10-year um, uh, program running in the Netherlands. Uh, different universities are related to this. And um, the focus really is on, on the, the entire breadth of um, uh, uh, developmental research. So it's about eye tracking in babies and um, ESM or experience sampling in adolescents. It's about real life uh, parenting interventions, fMRI, but also uh, bird song, how, how birds learn to sing. So it's really very, it's, it's like, yeah, basically the, the entire range of developmental research. And what we looked at in this, uh, in this evaluation was really what, what is the goal that researchers indicate in different places in the paper. And also um, note that, that there can be multiple goals in one paper. And so we looked at this in the, in the research question when they uh, formalized their hypothesis, but also in the discussion and the conclusion of the paper. And we found that indeed description is very popular. You see the dark red bars. Um, and also, uh, sorry, causation is also very popular, as you can see. So more than half of the papers are clearly driven by an interest in causal uh, relationships. Now, if we move to the second uh, component, the measurement, um, and we can think of things like the, how do you operationalize uh, what you want to measure? Of course, using an fMRI study is very different than uh, using self-report. Another thing that you can focus on is the actual design. And here we can again distinguish between three broad categories. So first of all, we have cross-sectional research in which we have a large sample of individuals that are measured at only one occasion, sometimes referred to as the snapshot. We also have longitudinal research, um, and then we can distinguish between panel research or panel data which consists of a few waves, so two, three, four, maybe five repeated measures, um, and many individuals, and uh, intensive longitudinal data, where you have many repeated measures, 20, 50, or even more than 100, uh, and it can be for one person, then typically it's referred to as a time series, or multiple individuals. And that's, of course, becoming much more popular nowadays with all the new technology, which makes it much easier to measure people uh, in such an intense way. Um, so, um, and the third category is experimental uh, designs. And then, of course, we can distinguish between a randomized controlled trial where different people uh, are assigned to different conditions or a re repeated measures design where the same people are experiencing the different conditions. Um, now, an important question then is, of course, how this uh, relates or how this connects to the different research goals that, that people may have. And uh, one um, that really pops out is, of course, experimental research as the, the royal road to investigating causal uh, research questions. And I think everybody is familiar with some version of this motto from uh, Paul Holland, who wrote, uh, no causation without manipulation. And the capitals are actually in the original. It's really like he's screaming at us. And this motto has been taken very literally by a lot of uh, researchers and, and also by uh, journal editors and so on. It's like we are not allowed to talk about causal interests when we have not done an experiment, when we have not manipulated the, the assumed cause. But in many cases, we cannot do a, 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 an experiment if we're interested in the effect of maternal depression, for instance, on the development of children. 
we cannot randomly assign families to, to the condition where the mother is going to be made depressed versus a condition where she's not made depressed. So we, we, we often have practical and ethical limitations, even though we have an interest in, in causal questions. And we might um, um, refer from using explicit causal language, but it shows through in different ways. So one um, is in our terminology, when we are talking about one thing that leads to another, or it has an impact, or it puts people at risk for, et cetera. Another is when we are talking about confounders. So if you are talking about confounders, that's a concept that only makes sense in the, in the context of causation. And of course, also when you talk about policy implications or you make suggestions for interventions, it means that you are interpreting your results in a causal manner. Now, there's a lot of literature um, uh, growing very fast across many different fields, including statistics, um, computational, or sorry, uh, computer science, um, uh, epidemiology, uh, which is all focusing on causal research in less ideal circumstances. And so also in, for instance, cross-sectional research or longitudinal research where we have not manipulated the assumed cause. Um, if you want to read more about it, I would definitely advise you to, to start with uh, Miguel Hernan, who is an epidemiologist who writes very clearly and very um, engaging about this topic. And uh, he's a great entrance into this uh, fast and, and um, uh, quickly developing area. Um, we looked in the 100 studies also to see what um, um, uh, design was being used and um, how this combined with the different uh, research goals that were formulated by the, the researchers. And what we see is that well, a lot of the research in SIT is actually longitudinal. We see that prediction is almost only based on um, uh, longitudinal research, but in the other areas we see that, uh, that so in description, but also for causation, we see that all three designs are being used. When we focus on uh, causation, we see that most of the studies are indeed experimental, but there is a catch here. Uh, we distinguished between studies in which the actual assumed cause was indeed manipulated versus studies in which the assumed cause was just observed. And to give an example of the latter, you might be doing an um, uh, experiment and um, you manipulate uh, some uh, visual condition and you look at what the effect is on uh, the brain activity and also on the behavior. And then one of the research questions might actually be about brain activity and behavior, which are just two observed variables, two outcome variables. And uh, there might still be uh, a confounder there, even though you are doing an experiment. Um, if you are interested in reading more about this, um, you can look at, for instance, McKinnon and uh, Perlow, uh, but there's a lot of other literature about this issue as well. So now connecting this also with the way that you analyze the data, of course, it's very important that how you measure your data and how you analyze uh, that this has to be in agreement with each other. Um, so there has to be a strong connection between those two. When we combine all three, uh, what we can do is, for instance, make a, a, a table like this. So we have the three different research goals. We have the three different designs. And then we can look at different uh, analysis techniques that fit into these different cells and, and um, that are appropriate in these scenarios. What we see is that a description can basically be easily combined with any of the designs, whereas causation is most easily combined with experimental research and more difficult to combine with, for instance, longitudinal or cross-sectional research. So the empty cells are not uh, to say that this is impossible, it's just to say that this is much more challenging and uh, requires more work more um, and more argumentation probably also. Um, so what I want to focus on now is the, the limitations of cross-sectional research. Um, because that will bring me to longitudinal research, assuming that we cannot do this experiment that we are actually interested in. So an important question then is, what is the limitation of cross-sectional research? And um, I really like this study by Bernard Schmitz and Ellen Skinner. It's almost 30 years ago already. And they looked at the relationship or, or the connection between cross-sectional results 
and the actual within-person process. And what they did was they were looking at the relationship between perceived control, uh, effort, and academic performance in children in school. And they found cross-sectionally, so at one point in time, they found that those children who experienced more control, they put in more effort. When they put uh, those children who put in more effort, they perform better. And the children who perform better actually experience more control. Now it's very easy to think of this then as some sort of uh, cycle that 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 uh, strengthens itself. But that would think, uh, be a step from the cross-sectional results to a within-person causal process. So. The question is, does this actually reflect the process that is taking place at the within-person level? So does experiencing more control lead a, does this actually lead a child to put in more effort at the next, next task? And if the child puts in more effort, does this lead the child to perform better? And if um, the child performs better, does this lead the child to experience more control? That would actually be this causal process. And what they did in this study is that they actually um, also measured a number of children at many uh, occasions, so many uh, cognitive tasks that they had to perform in the, or academic tasks that they had to perform in the classroom. And then they used time series analysis to see whether these uh, at least predictive relationships exist within the child. And for some children, they found a pattern that was very much in agreement with the cross-sectional results. But they also found children who had a very different pattern. So children who, if they uh, experienced more control, if they uh, performed better, would actually put in less effort the next time because they were like, yeah, you know, I can do this. It's not a big deal. And then if they performed less well, they would actually put in more effort the next time. So, of course, this also makes a lot of sense from an individual perspective. So I think this is a very appealing study because it's actually studying um, um, how these two relate to each other in, in empirical data. Um, when we think about, uh, is this really something that's very common that we try to generalize from the cross-sectional level to the process level? Um, uh, this might be, of course, a, a question. Uh, one example where it's very explicit that the, the researchers are assuming this is in this um, a quote from McCray and John, uh, who have worked on the big five or the, big, the, the five factor model uh, of personality. So what they are saying is personality processes by definition involve some change in thoughts, feelings and action of an individual. And all these intra-individual or within person changes seem to be measured, uh, mirrored by inter-individual or between person differences in characteristic ways of thinking, feeling and acting. So they are then saying that by studying individual differences, we can actually get a glimpse of the within-person uh, changes and within-person process. Now, Raymond Cattell, uh, the founder, for instance, of the journal uh, Multivariate Behavioral Research and uh, also the inventor of the P-technique analysis, um, he was one of the people who actually criticized this idea. And he um, uh, said that cross-sectional research is like taking a snapshot for which it is impossible to tell the difference between a mountain and a wave, where the mountain is there and it will be there, you know, at all the next snapshots as well, whereas the wave is only there for one snapshot and is probably gone uh, or replaced by another wave at the next snaps snapshot. Um, now, to explain this further, there is this idea of, okay, uh, that these cross-sectional results and the within-person process um, we often make use of the typing example because it's a very appealing example. So suppose we are looking at um, 100 people and we are looking at how many words they can type per minute and also the percentage of typos that they make. And we find this slightly negative relationship in that people who uh, type faster make fewer mistakes, whereas people who type slower make more mistakes. Now, nobody would interpret this as saying, well, if I want to make fewer mistakes when I have to type something, I just have to type faster. Because we know that at the within-person level, there's going to be a positive relationship. And this is true for probably every person. So that's what the red ellipses are referring here, different people. And they're all characterized by the same within-person relationship. If they try to type faster, they are going to make more mistakes. 
So where does this cross-sectional relationship come from? Why is it negative? It's because the stable between person differences actually show this negative relationship. So we see these blue dots, they represent basically the trade level of individuals or their equilibrium state. Or, um, and when we look at this blue relationship here, it is the between person relationship. It's a negative relationship indicating here a person who can type very fast and makes very few mistakes versus here as an individual who types very slow and makes a lot of mistakes. This relationship could, of course, be related to uh, something like experience or uh, perhaps even age, uh, where some people are just faster uh, than others and more accurate. And um, what you see is that when you look at cross-sectional data, you get the mix of the red and the blue line. And to what extent it represents one or the other is basically impossible to tell. What is also important to realize here, I think, is that replication does not solve this problem. We can do this cross-sectional research again and again and again, and each time find this negative relationship. But that does not make the interpretation of this relationship as a causal one more correct. So it really is, we just get a very clear description of the relationship in the population, but it's not necessarily a causal relationship. And what is also important then to think about is that we might have different causal mechanisms that operate at these different levels. So as I said, the blue one might be more related to experience, whereas the red one might be more related to motivation or uh, fatigue. So now that we have established the limitations of cross-sectional research, because it cannot distinguish between within and between, the next question then, of course, is, well, how can we separate the two from each other? And the obvious answer here is multi-level analysis. Make sure you have repeated measures for each individual and then separate within from between using a multi-level model. But we can also do it um, with the data in wide format. So um, if you have longitudinal data, you can either arrange your data in long format or in wide format. So long format is compatible with uh, multi-level analysis. So you have your repeated measures like this, um, uh, and then you have um, uh, a variable that indicates that all these measures belong to person one and then person two and so on. You can also have the data in wide format, and that's um, compatible with structural equation modeling. Um, so then you have one row for each individual, and the different time points are represented by different variables. And in this uh, paper, recent publication in Psychological Methods, uh, we show how the two are related to each other and how this separation uh, or, or decomposition into within and between can be done in both uh, formats and also um, which, um, under which scenarios the two lead to the exact same results. So it's actually, I have to admit, this is the paper I'm probably most proud of. So if you're going to read anything of me, please read this one. Um, we can also look at this, this idea of separating within from between when we are doing factor analysis. So if we have repeated measures and we have a factor model for each wave, we can also look at ways to distinguish between from within. And this is, so, as you can see in the title, using a few snapshots to dist distinguish mountains from waves. It's really related to this uh, idea of uh, uh, Raymond Cattell. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to separate the common traits, so what all the indicators have in common with each other and also over time. So the trait part does not vary over time. A unique trait, so that's what is unique to a particular indicator, um, but is stable over time. The common state, which is what the indicators have in common, but which varies over time. And the unique state, which is unique to a particular indicator and that varies over time. And this is the model that we proposed, and it actually has been proposed by others as well. We refer to it as the CUTS model to say common, common and unique trait and state model. And what it shows is uh, we have uh, four indicators measured at three different time points. And what you see is we have the between part here, where we have the common trait, 
So all the indicators are related to the common trade at all the, the three waves. We also have the unique trade, which is um, a, a, a factor for a particular indicator um, over time. And then we have the common state, so that's what the, the indicators have in common, but it varies over time. And then over here, with the, these are like the, the single arrows here, they are the unique states. And we showed that um, and we, we, we use this uh, also for empirical data. You can actually use it when you only have two waves of data. You can already separate these four sources of variance. And uh, we used it for this data set um, uh, where the, 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 the data came from uh, elderly people. And the question was whether this uh, concept of togetherness was actually one factor or were, that these were like two separate factors, emotional togetherness and social togetherness. And what we found in the end was that this model over here fits uh, the best. So there was at the trade level, there was just one factor, but at the state level, there were actually two separate factors. And of course, this is only something that you can uh, find when you are actually looking for it. Um, uh, if you are just doing factor analysis like we are used to doing it, you will never find that there are different numbers of factors at the between, so at the trade level and at the state level, the within level. Um, Another way uh, of thinking about separating within from between is um, when we are interested in cross-leg relationships. So cross-leg relationship is when you are looking for the um, uh, regression coefficients from one variable to another over time. And um, the cross-leg panel model is a very popular model in this respect. And in 2015, we published a critique of the cross-leg panel model uh, saying, well, that the problem with this model is that it doesn't distinguish between stability that comes from moment-to-moment uh, -moment stability versus stability that comes from a trade. And instead, we proposed this alternative model, which is referred to as the random intercept cross-leg panel model, in which we separate and we, we decompose each observed variable into two parts, a between-person part, referred to here as the random intercept, and a within-person part. And the within-person part varies over time, and that's where we have the lag relationships that actually uh, model the dynamics over time. Um, there's actually also a paper coming out from uh, Jeroen Mulder and me in uh, Structural Equation Modeling, which discusses three extensions of the random intercept cross-leg panel model, so including covariates um, and also um, multiple indicators. And a third extension that I cannot remember right now. Um, so the idea of this model is really that we want to, um, what, what the original model is doing is just comparing people's scores to the ground mean. So in this case, uh, we, we have the orange person here, we have the pink person here, and their scores are compared to the average um, um, of, of all the people. And so we see that the pink person is always scoring negative and the orange person is always scoring positive. But once we take out the stable between person differences, what we get is, look, is something that looks like this. So we see that now this person has a negative score here and a positive score here. And this person has positive scores on the first two occasions and then two negative scores. So you see that it's, it's, you, you really get uh, different uh, scores for the within person part once you um, uh, take out the stable between person differences. And then you are going to look at the dynamics of these, so from one variable to another. And this is, um, uh, uh, of course, where, where it becomes more interesting when you actually do this with empirical data. And um, uh, the conclusions that you draw based on the traditional model versus the random intercept cross leg panel model actually may change. Um, and this is an example, this is a, this is a very strong example uh, by Luz Kaisers and others, where they looked at the relationship between uh, privacy invasion by the parents and uh, secrecy by the adolescents. And what they found was that in the traditional model, there were positive relationships, cross-leg relationships between those variables. So you would say that um, parental uh, privacy invasion leads to more secrecy and more secrecy leads to more uh, invasion. When they separated the between and the within person uh, variants from each other, 
with the random intercept cross leg panel model, they found actually a negative cross leg relationship from secrecy to privacy invasion. And the leg relationship in the other direction was not significant. So you can see that it can really change the uh, conclusions that you draw about what is happening within a person or in this case within a family. And I'm not saying that this is what we should expect all the time, that the actual sign of these cross-leg uh, cross relations changes. It may happen, probably in most cases, it does not change, but it still means that um, the strength of the relationship can be very different once we've taken out the between person differences. And as long as we don't do it, we will not know. So I think that in itself is already reason enough to, to try it. Of course, there's many other uh, panel models also for, for cross-sectional, uh, sorry, cross-legged <laughs> relations. And I co-authored this paper with uh, Satoshi Usami and uh, Ku Murayama, in which we looked at the most uh, common ones that, that we are aware of. And uh, we also relate them to each other. Um, so, so, yeah, if you want to know more about alternatives uh, for this kind of uh, modeling, you can check out that paper and see how they are related to each other. Of course, we can also be looking at cross-leg relationships in intensive longitudinal data. So, for instance, uh, daily diaries or um, experience sampling or ambulatory assessments. And um, that's um, uh, one thing that I have been involved with uh, for this is the development of dynamic structural equation modeling, which is a toolbox in M+ that is specifically designed to analyze intensive longitudinal data and to look at the uh, dynamic relationships, so lagged relationships over time. And um, when, you, when you think about it, one thing that um, we already could do with multi-level modeling was, for instance, looking at negative effects and how it's related to negative events and how this is different for different individuals. So we see that the different slopes for different individuals and what we can do with dynamic structural equation modeling is also look at lagged relationships between the same variables. So, for instance, current negative effect and preceding negative effect, and then look at the autoregressive parameter and how this differs across different individuals. And of course, we can also look at cross lagged relationships. And that's what we did here um, based on the Cogito study, which was done at the Max Planck Institute more than 10 years ago now. Um, and the, what we did was we, we decomposed, so again, it's about decomposing the observed variables into a between part and a within part. So the between part is here, the within part is here, and the dynamics are modeled at the within part. And we have all these random slopes here, so these black dots refer to the fact that this slope here is different for different individuals. And these become variables at the between level, and then we can further analyze this with all kinds of models if we are interested. Um, DSEM has many uh, opportunities, so it's multivariate, you can do latent variables, you can do moving average terms, and so on. There's also a lot of other software that is being designed uh, to analyze intensive longitudinal data, So, uh, and I think we will see much more of this also in the next um, few years, 10 years, who knows. So for a long time, I have to admit, I thought, okay, we just separate within from between. So we get rid of these stable between person differences and we just focus on the within part because that's where the dynamics happen. That's the interesting part. But of course, an important question is where do these between person differences actually come from? They, they, they don't just drop from the sky. So what, where do they come from? What do they mean? And when could they be interesting? And I think this quote from uh, Baltus Rees and Nessel wrote is really uh, um, enlightening in this sense. So they wrote, uh, typically inter-individual or between person differences at a later time are cumulative results of previous intra-individual or within person changes that differ across individuals. And they also say in the same uh, book that if we take conception as the ideal zero point of development, there are no individual differences yet in, for instance, uh, cognitive skills or neuroticism, not here at conception. 
There are, of course, different, uh, there's difference in potential due to genetics and cultural and uh, geographic uh, factors, social economic factors, but that's different in potential of where you might end up. But at this point, there's not yet uh, something like difference in um, intelligence. So if at a later point in time we observe a difference, it is because people developed in different ways. So that's basically what they're saying. So between person differences always are related to differences in within person uh, processes. And I think that's very interesting to, to keep in mind. And it relates actually to this idea of the measurement burst design that uh, uh, John Nesselrode pr proposed in the early 90s of the last century. And he uh, basically said, well, he, what he proposed was uh, to have very uh, intensive measurements and then uh, repeat this at a later time. So it's like these bursts uh, and then repeated waves of these bursts. And you can think of this like maybe there's like some sort of development going on. And then you have this, you zoom in uh, for seven days and you get a lot of information during those seven days. And then you repeat this six months later and so on. And when you start to think about development like this or any process really, if it's emotion regulation or cognitive functioning or whatever, basically, you can see that, yeah, you can zoom in like this or zoom out. And, it's, and what shows up as stable and what shows up as a trend or what shows up as fluctuations really depends on the perspective that you take. And um, um, so when you think about the random intercept cross leg panel model, yeah, you have these repeated measures. So there is a stable part, it's the between part. But if we would repeat the same design sometime later, we would again get a between person part. So, uh, and, and that might be different than the between person part that we got in the first wave. So it, it, it really is a matter of perspective. Now related to this then is the question, how frequently should we measure? And for this, I want to make a little detour um, in management uh, research. So I found this paper by Zahir and others, and it's, it's a very um, um, enlightening paper I found. Um, and they basically say, well, you have these different kinds of time intervals that we can look at. So you have to look at how long the phenomenon exists. You have to look at um, how, what the time scale is that the, the theory is related to. So that's, that's all theory related. And then you also have the, the amount of time spent by the study. You have um, the number of uh, frequency, uh, the, the, the frequency of the measurements and also what you do with the data. And they show this also um, for the financial market. So here they show Monday to Friday with six hour intervals. But then, so you see this nice cycle, but then they also show what happens if you look at one hour intervals and you see much more going on. So for instance, over here they say, yeah, so here the, the uh, Asian market is starting up, but then you have what they refer to as the Japanese lunch break. So you have this little dip and then the European market start up. So you get this spike here and so on. Um, this is another uh, version of it, but now with the weekend in front of it, so Saturday and Sunday when nothing is happening, and this then is it for a much longer period of time, so a number of weeks. So again, you see that uh, what, you, what you get really depends on how much you zoom in or out. And to take this a little bit closer to home, um, there is this study by Adolf in Psych Review. And they, they were looking at what is the shape of developmental change, um, questioning whether this idea that children don't have a skill and then suddenly have the skill, uh, whether this, this abrupt change is really how development um, uh, goes. And what they did was they collected daily measures from birth to 18 months, so one and a half years, on uh, 32 motor skills from 11 children. And they wanted to see what happens if you don't uh, uh, measure that often versus if you measure that often in terms of the shape of development. And they said, well, that basically these, these changes that these are very abrupt are actually artifacts of sampling. So only 16 of the series that they observed were showing this abrupt change. That's what we see in this one, uh, the first one. 
And all the other uh, series were characterized by this period of variability where children were showing the skill one day and then not showing it maybe for one or two days and so on until they started to show it every day. So again, it shows that uh, the, the shape that you get or the information you get really depends on, on how much you zoom in or out. So then the question becomes, well, is the smaller interval always better? Is it the smallest possible the best? And in this respect, I would like to refer to uh, Kahneman and Rees, who um, wrote about this and, and or, or, or who were saying that an, an individual's life could be described at impractical length as a string of moments. It's like we just experience all these moments. Um, so then you would think like, yeah, that, that is really where life is happening in, in this string of moments. And um, Dorman and Griffin, uh, criticize this panel research where you have these large intervals of six months, for instance, between uh, between the measurements, and said, well, we should be looking much more at, at what is the optimal lag or interval between measurements for a particular process. And they call for shortitudinal studies, as they refer to it. But they also indicate that it shouldn't be too short. So they say, well, maybe if the interval is less than one day, then uh, this, this doesn't really uh, there, there's no substantive change that is related to the to the process that we are, are interested in. So this is an interesting uh, question, I think, and maybe also refers back to uh, Kahneman, who differs between the um, uh, experiencing self, who is actually experiencing all these moments, versus the remembering self, who reconstructs what has happened. And maybe for some research questions, this reconstruction is actually more important than the actual experiences, but who knows? So then the question is, um, an important other question is, um, what should we do with trends in our data? Especially if we are studying development, we will often find trends in our data. And I've tried to stay away from this part actually for, the, for as long as possible, to be honest. But yeah, at some point you have to admit that yeah, we also have these trends in the data. And the problem is that if we have two variables that uh, change over time, then and we will find a relationship between the two if we don't do anything with it. So um, uh, if two things are going up together, then you will be very able to predict one from the other just because there is a trend. Before I uh, go into this in, in, in a bit more detail, I want to make the distinction between the number of waves you have and the age at which the people were measured. So you might think, um, hey, I just have two waves of data, so I cannot really do much interesting stuff. But if the participants had different ages uh, at these different waves, or, if, or within a wave, they had different ages, then you actually might have much richer data than you uh, realize. So this is, for instance, two waves from the child developmental uh, development supplement of the panel study of income uh, dynamics. And at the first wave, the children were between five and 13 years old. And then the second wave was five years later. So the children were between 10 and 19. And then they added some new children as well. So when you think about plotting this uh, and, and or organizing your data, not according to wave, but according to age, you actually get the entire range from five to 19 years old. And you can actually see what kind of curve um, um, is underneath these data, even though per person you never have more than two measurement occasions. So I think that's a very neat uh, thing to keep in mind when you're doing longitudinal research. When uh, thinking about trends and, and lagged effects, uh, the paper that I mentioned before by uh, Satoshi Usami uh, actually discusses this also. So um, there are some models that, in that paper that also include trends over time. And it's done in different ways. So you can read more about it if, if you want to get a better grip uh, on, on what's being done. And another paper that I really want to mention is the paper by uh, Wang and Maxwell. They are looking at multi-level models, um, just the XY relationships, so not a lag relationship. And they looked at the effect uh, that it has if you if you include time as a covariate, if you detrend X or you detrend X and Y, and how this affects the relationship between X and Y. And they found that actually these three scenarios lead to the same uh, estimate of the effect of X on Y. So I thought this is a very 
uh, important um, um, information to know about. And they also showed that this is actually different. So the, the, the effect differs from what you get when you don't include time at all, or if you only detrends the outcome variable. So um, you really see that uh, if you are interested in the effect, potentially the causal effect of X on Y, it's really important to think about what to do with trends over time. And um, I'm getting towards the end. Um, so um, uh, another important question then is, well, what is the rationale for including time or age uh, as a predictor in your model or as a potential co confounder? And um, I think also it's, it's clear that if the interest is in the um, relationship between X and Y, that if we put in age, uh, this can really make a difference. But what is the effect of age actually? So uh, Baltus and, and Ries and Nessel wrote to say, well, that al although time is inextricably linked to the concept of development, in itself, it cannot explain any aspect of developmental change. So it's, it's saying basically that time is not, it's, yeah, you can use it as a predictor, but it's not a cause of anything. And um, there's, there's other people from long time ago who wrote similar things um, saying it's it's yeah, including time or including age as a predictor uh, might seem uh, sensible, but it's it's not necessarily um, uh, something that yeah it's it's something that we have to think about more more deeply to to understand what it actually means. So um, I think this is this is work that we would we will be um, working on, but hopefully others will be working on this as well in the near future. So the question then is how to proceed. And um, uh, I think that uh, what is important is really to, to always focus on these three key aspects of empirical research and to see how they are related. And as you see now, I actually also draw these um, uh, arrows as two headed to indicate that, that we have this research goal and, and we, our, our ideal might be that the research goal is leading, but sometimes new opportunities in measurement or in, in analysis actually also trigger new ways of thinking about phenomena. And I think this is something that we really see with the intensive longitudinal data and the dynamic modeling, that we are starting to think about uh, psychological processes in, in different ways and, and that it's actually helping us also to, to maybe develop new theory about this as well. So what is our research question? That's definitely a fundamental question. Um, and then of course, in terms of measurement, how frequent should we measure? Uh, that's still an unanswered question for me. And I think it's, it depends, it depends on the context. Um, and also uh, in terms of analysis, especially when interested in development, it's like, what do we do with the trend over time or um, uh, over age? And other fundamental questions that are important in developmental research is um, how can we relate processes unfolding at different time scales? So when I think of uh, raising children, it's say we, we um, might say that they're not allowed to do something and we have a conflict in the short run, but how does this affect our relationship in the long run or their behavior in the long run? Um, and perhaps it's better to have this short term uh, conflict um, in order to um, make sure that we don't have lots, much, much bigger conflicts in the future, but how do we relate these different time scales to each other? Um, the same goes also for uh, personality. Yeah? The personality plays out in the moments um, in how we respond to events and how we shape our environment and how we interpret uh, uh, comments that are being made and th all those kind of things. And at the same time, personality is something that's very stable. So how do we relate these different time scales? Um, also, uh, what is the consequence of measuring over intervals? So instead of saying, oh, how are you feeling right now? We ask, how were you doing during the last day? So, and, and of course the intervals are also used a lot in panel data where we say, how are you, what, how does this describe you over the last six months, for instance? How does this actually affect what we are trying to get at? And another fundamental question is how can we relate development in one area to development in another area? I think this is uh, one of the key questions that, in my opinion, uh, has not been settled yet. Uh, of course, there's different models for this, but uh, all the models have uh, 
major disadvantages, I think. So it's, it's how is a growth in one area related to growth in another area, especially if we want to not just describe this, we can use a latent growth curve model, but if we actually want to know how, um, uh, if development in one area is necessary to be able to develop in another area. And of course, these developments don't go with these nice smooth curves. So these are just some fundamental questions. I'm sure there's many more that you can come up with also. Um, but for now, I want to thank you. Thank you very I much Dan, for this. Uh, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very rich uh, talk basically tackling all the important questions in environmental science that are currently around. Uh, so I can imagine there are uh, a lot of questions that we uh, could deal with now. Um, and as I introduced in the beginning, we start with our fellows. And here, uh, Yannick uh, would uh, like to ask the first questions. And I would encourage uh, all fellows and later the audience to use the chat and the uh, uh, question options to uh, to indicate if you would like to uh, to talk to Ellen and uh, pose your questions here. So Yannick. Uh, well, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And my question refers to something that I've seen pop up from time to time in longitudinal models, which is combining the longitudinal um, autoregressive cross-vect effects with contemporaneous effects. Um, within one time point or within one measurement occasion. And I was wondering what you're thinking about this idea of modeling longitudinal data. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. Um, so it, it, it really depends. So I think that what we see in, in both in the, the panel studies that use cross-sectional relationships, but also in dynamic structural equation modeling, so where we have the intensive longitudinal uh, data, so much denser in time, we see that actually most of the relationship between variables is still in the correlated residuals. So that would be uh, the contemporaneous uh, residual uh, covariances. And um, this can indicate a, a number of things. Um, um, so it could be that there is an unobserved third variable that is actually driving both variables. Um, and, and so that's why we have a residual uh, covariance or correlation. It could also uh, be the result of the fact that uh, the variables influence each other at a much shorter interval than the one that was used in the measurements. And um, especially with panel data, I think uh, we are looking, for instance, at uh, children and, and, and uh, some aspect of parenting, and we look at intervals of six months. It's huge, you know, it's like as if nothing happens in between. So, it, it, and also when we think of daily diary studies, when you are looking at spouses and how they, they feel uh, about their relationship, for instance, you can imagine that a lot happens within the same day rather than from one day to the next. So, um, I think, um, uh, yeah, those residual covariances or correlations are very interesting. Um, there are people who are really trying then to also infer the direction of this lag zero correlation and this I find more problematic because for instance when we think about um, uh, spouses influencing each other I don't think it's only from the husband to the wife or only from the wife to the husband I don't think that makes sense so and and with those models typically you can only have uh, one direction within uh, uh, the contemporaneous uh, part of the model. So you would argue more for the maybe undirected graphical models that Edscom et al. are using in the continuous. Um, yeah, so another thing is, um, um, I think another thing to think about in this context also is that the degree that to which the residuals are still related uh, also depends on the interval between your observations. So if the interval becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, at some point, the residuals will have the same correlation as the original series because the lagged relationships become zero. So for me, I think I can understand that um, it's interesting to look at the contemporaneous or lag zero relationships without looking, without correcting for the autoregressive part. 
or um, I think it's yeah, it's part of the, the entire model. And then um, I think yeah, it's still interesting, but I wouldn't uh, I, I I would not use it to to draw uh, conclusions or even to develop hypotheses about the the uh, causal structure there. Uh, another line of, of, of research is, of course, continuous time modeling, which uh, Manuel Voeckle is, is working on a lot uh, with others. And, um, and then it, it's really what you try to do is, is um, actually look at those curves. So, so when you say that one variable has an effect on another, if the interval is super short, there has been no time for one variable to have an effect on another. And then as time increases, then there can be an effect. And then at some point, this wears off. And um, you can use discrete uh, time series models like the, the, the VAR model and then um, uh, reconstruct what the continuous time model would have been or, or is. And um, that's also work that is being done. And, and I think that's also interesting uh, to look at because it also shows that these correlated residuals really, they change also depending on the interval between the observations. It's, it's all related to each other, just as well as that the strength of the lagged relationships depends on the interval between the observations. So even saying that this is the effect of X on Y always has to be in relationship to the interval between the two variables. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have the next question by Andrea Hasel. Sorry, uh, I cannot hear you yet. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Ellen. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have to say I'm a huge fan because <laughs> I uh, was very involved with um, dynamic structural equation models and also the DSEM application uh, in M plus for maybe the last seven or eight months. And uh, this talk is a very great uh, chance for me to get some of my questions <laughs> off the hook. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, if it's okay, I, I basically I have three questions for you. So, um, the first one, which I was wondering, uh, oftentimes when I was dealing with um, with DSEM or with um, lax effects in general. Uh, first, I was wondering, what does the word causal mean in a dynamic systems context? And also, you know, I'm never sure when I say, I don't know, my outcome um, today is linked to my outcome tomorrow, right? Does it say it predicts my outcome tomorrow or does it say it leads to my outcome tomorrow if there is an autoregressive relationship? So this is my first question. Maybe the second question is a related one. So um, when you showed the, the boxes where you mapped a description and um, for example, causation or prediction, I was wondering, would you say that dynamic SAMs um, might fill the empty box uh, that crosses longitudinal and causation? So th these are the first two questions. And then the, mm -hmm. the third one is a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, I think um, there's two, two aspects to this, uh, to this kind of question. Yeah. On the one hand, it is what is motivating us? What is our research goal? And I think that oftentimes when we are doing dynamic modeling, we're really interested in causal relationships. We're interested in, in the actual mechanism, how one thing leads to another. So that is our interest, that's our motivation. Whether we can actually draw these conclusions, that's a mm. whole different ball game, of course. Um, so the problem um, is that we, even though we have longitudinal data, we, it's still observational data or correlational yeah. data. It's not, there's not an experimental manipulation. What is the major problem then? It's uh, and that we might have confounding. So an unobserved third variable that actually um, causes the relationship between two variables that we have observed. And that can be two variables at different occasions also. What is nice, I think, about the um, uh, dynamic structural equation modeling and also about uh, the random intercept cross lag panel model and some of the other uh, panel models is that they separate within from between, which means they are actually 
um, and when you look at the dynamic parts for, at the within part, it is uh, you don't you no longer have to be concerned about confounders that are stable over time because all of that is in the random intercepts or in the between person part. So that's parcelled out. And I think that's a very, very uh, attractive aspect of these kind of yeah. models. Yeah. However, there's still, of course, the possibility of a time varying confounder. And that is something that we will not solve. It's that's something that's definitely there. It's a huge problem. We should never ignore it. Uh, but of course, we do this a lot of the time when we are talking still about oh, one thing leading to another, carefully uh, um, avoiding the word causal, but still thinking about everything in a causal manner. Yeah. And um, um, so I don't think that that um, dynamic modeling or intensive longitudinal data are the solution to this. Um, and that's also uh, when you look in the econometrics literature, uh, that's all about uh, a time series analysis. So then it's a single case. So you don't have to worry about stable between person or case differences. There's only one case. And also there, it's it's a huge question how to, to determine whether a particular predictive relationship is actually a causal relationship. No, I can't hear you. Okay, again. sorry, my, my internet connection was unstable. Okay. Okay, great. But I will I will uh, I will see it. Okay. Um okay, so you would say basically like in the interpretation sense that it's still a theoretical decision kind of whether my autoregressive relationship is more predictive or can imply causality in a way right okay yeah it's well yeah you have to think uh, in a way of course the best way would be to think also about uh, potential confounders and to measure yeah. them and include them also in the model but yeah, um, yeah that easily explodes of course um, yeah. But nevertheless, I think it's um, uh, and the paper that I uh, refer to by uh, Miguel Hernan is really interesting yeah. in this respect. So he, what he is saying is we uh, we we are not doing any good by avoiding causal state or, or causal language when that is our actual motivation. Yeah. So what we should do is in the dis or, sorry in the introduction we should be talking about causal causality. Even in the design and everything, we should be talking about causality. When we talk about the results, that's where we shouldn't be talking about causality. But mm -hmm. as soon as we start to, when we get to the discussion, we should be talking about causality again. And only if we are clear about our causal interests can other people then come in and say, well, you know, you forgot about this particular confounder, which is most likely to actually, you know, be the reason why these things are related. And now let's do this study again including this confound then we can actually move forward but if we are not willing to say it then mm -hmm. other people can comment on it but of course this really uh, it will require a lot of uh, a change in 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 what we have been taught and and how we are um, conditioned basically thank you very much <laughs> Okay, if, if I may, I don't know how many other questions there are. Otherwise, I would I would pose also the, the second one. But Markus, you have to say um, if that's okay. I would uh, allow a second question now uh, okay. at this point. Uh, and I would like to invite the audience now also to uh, to pose questions. Please use the, the, the questions panel uh, to indicate uh, your interest in, in asking questions to Ellen. Uh, and, um, now, uh, Andrea, please. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, the next topic I was thinking about quite a lot um, in the last months was how would you actually differentiate between something like an external trend in a time series and um, and and non-stationarity that is inherent in a mechanism or a process. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this? Like, what 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 have you yeah. been thinking about? What is the distinction? Can you give an well, example? I have, you know, like, 
I have been thinking about um, the use, for, ex for example, in, uh, in, in Plus, right, in the uh, toolbox for DSEM. You have the options of DSEM and um, RDSEM, so residual DSEM, mm -hmm. where you model uh, the trend separately from the mechanism. But, for example, um, okay, how, how do I explain this? If you look at wage data, for example, and you look at um, uh, at developments within a cohort, so you see, okay, at, at the beginning there are small differences between people in wages, and if you look uh, 30 years later, these differences have exploded or expanded, let's say it like that. And um, of course, there is some kind of trend in the data, right? Because um, there isn't a stable mean. But um, if you're interested in the, or I'm interested in the mechanisms, in the within-person mechanisms that cause uh, the um, expansion between persons. And there is this non-stationarity in the individuals also within the sample. Um, but there is, for me, from the theoretical perspective, no, no, um, it doesn't make sense to model a trend um, separately from uh, the model because I'm interested in exactly the non-stationary process. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I think so. Um, I think our DSEM. That's really it's for intensive longitudinal data. What you are referring to with wages is probably more like panel data. But um, with the RDSEM option, uh, what could be of interest is hey, you, you are interested in an effect of something you've measured repeatedly, an X variable on a Y variable, but you want to take out some trend. And this can also be like a sine wave, for instance, or an effect of the, the, the uh, day of the week, something like this. And actually, as far as I can see, but um, we are actually working on this right now um, uh, together with uh, Banks Mutain and uh, Luz Geysers. Uh, so hopefully that will become a paper not too long from now. Um, we are looking at, at those kind of models. And I think that when I think about what um, uh, Wang and Maxwell were saying, when it was not about a lag relationship, but just a lag zero relationship, yeah. whether you include time as a covariate, yeah or whether you so that would be like mod, modeling it as part of the model versus detrending x and y and then looking at the relationship which is more like rd sem although rd sem does it in the same model but it's yeah still really separated from each other yeah it leads to the same estimate of the effect of x on y what is different between those two approaches is the what is considered the effect of time right? yeah i would say the effect of time but yeah, yeah. Um, because one will just have only direct effects on the observations, whereas the other will have the other model, the other approach will have direct effects, but also indirect effects through all the lag relationships. Again, yeah. if you want to read more about this aspect, you can look at uh, the paper by Satoshi Usami and, and uh, Ku Morayama and me. Um, and we are also referring there to a paper that I wrote, I think, in 2005 about the ALT model, the, the autoregressive latent trajectory yeah. model versus a model in which you have latent growth curve with autoregressive residuals. And again, I was showing that you get the same autoregressive parameter, but you get different um, yeah, slope parameters, which you can then transfer to the other one under certain conditions. So. Um, and I th was thinking of another part of your question was, um, um, yeah, so you're interested in, in this development of the, of the wages. And of course, the, the, the model that springs to mind then is also a just a latent growth curve model. That's like the number one model that most people would use if they see, ah, there's growth curves and people have different growth curves. They start out close together and then they, you know, they, they, they develop in different directions. And of course, then what you get is, is just a description. I really think yeah. that the latent growth curve model is a descriptive model. Um, and uh, we get an intercept and a slope. And then, of course, you can include predictors for the intercept and for the slope. And then see that, OK, people with more education develop faster, for instance, than others. And you are, of course, tempted then to think about that relationship as a causal one. But um, it nevertheless, leads to the question whether time 
can really be a cause of wage because that's time will then be the sort of like mediator in this relationship from from education to wage so it's it's very interesting questions indeed <laughs> yes it's something that you can think of about probably uh, for many years that's what i intend to do anyway yeah yeah it keeps me awake at night <laughs> so, yeah 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 it helps me get back to sleep at night <laughs> okay thank you very much thank you too uh, thank you um and now I would uh, go on with uh, with a question myself here. Uh, you, you tackled some of the, the, the big issues in uh, developmental science. Uh, what's the uh, the role of time? Uh, what is uh, the role of development? And what's the role of age? And uh, how causation uh, plays uh, into these processes? Uh, you mentioned these questions, but uh, you may forgive me, but you did not give us an intuition about what is your take on it. So uh, let's start with one of them. Uh, if, if age itself is not a, a, a causal entity, uh, what is uh, aging in development? What what is uh, uh, doing the, the causal action here? Yeah, I think this um, is almost a question that I cannot really give any sensible answers to because I think it really it, it depends on the context so or the, or the the area that you're interested in, and it requires a lot, I guess, of um, like really substantive knowledge about this area but i could imagine that there are uh, processes such as um, um development of, of of brain structures which take place over time and that once certain uh, developments have taken place then certain um uh, skills can actually be learned or uh, certain um uh, uh, skills are actually unlearned so to speak so i think um as, as, as some of the quotes that I was giving, and I did not want to read them all out loud, but um, uh, I can send you the, the quotes if you're if you're not familiar with them. But it, it really is this idea that age is, I guess, it's a proxy. It's a proxy of development, and then this development is, of course, a huge black box which contains many things, and and it contains uh, physiological um, developments of the brain and so on but also um, uh, just uh, experiences that we have as, as we are learning and, and living our lives. So um, um, I think in that sense, it, it makes, of course, perfect sense to say that, uh, because uh, one of the quotes was also saying like, yeah, the events or the experience by definition require time to actually be able to be experienced. And so therefore, time is a dimension that is important or age is a dimension that is important but it's 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 still very challenging then to think about um what this actually is and i think one of the problems that i have with with most of the models is that time or age are just put in there and we we get these deterministic trends over time it's like a linear growth curve or a quadratic one or whatever Whereas I think, yeah, but, you know, there might be these really um, critical experiences that you have. Maybe, you know, when you were 11, uh, your parents divorced, or maybe um, you were picked on at school one day and it was really hurtful and it really changed how you felt. And maybe it's like this very small moment or it's a bigger event, but it can actually change the um, direction of your trajectory. And none of these models are really doing a good job at allowing for those kind of random inputs that change the direction of the trajectory. So all the trajectories are basically given by the parameters uh, in the model. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm really curious about whether this is an important um, aspect uh, to, to consider and also how to to incorporate it in a model and i'm afraid that since it doesn't exist that perhaps yeah it's not possible to do it and you can only do it if you've actually observed those critical uh, inputs um i think it, sorry 
Okay. So, so uh, what I get from from uh, from your explanation now, and here I would uh, mostly agree, uh, is that uh, typically in, in most studies we treat time and development as a as a as a variable that needs to be unpacked, that but to, that we do not be, uh, are not able to unpack or do not dare to unpack because we don't have enough substantial knowledge about what it should be yet. It's just yeah. a kind of a summary that we, that we use. Yeah. And it, yeah. So we might yeah, end up know. with different age and time in different types of uh, of subjects where we uh, that we study. Sorry. So so we might end up with a different role for time and age, uh, maybe dependent on the subjects that we study. So that age in a, in, a, in one. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I know um, uh, a few studies in which instead of uh, what they call chronological age, they use um, another measure. So it's it's uh, a measure to to determine the developmental stage in puberty, and um, mm -hmm. I, I think they distinguish between four uh, different uh, phases. And then they, they compare the effect of this developmental age versus the, the chronological age, and they find it, it's a more important predictor. And of course, another the question to causality is, or the step to causality is yet another one. But um, um, I, and I think, yeah, that's nice with puberty because that's like, I guess, quite clear that we, we can have these physical uh, appearances that determine, or from which we can derive some sort of, um, uh, developmental stage and, and uh, which is related of course to hormones and those kind of um, um, processes but um, at most other stages in life we don't have these clear physical um, factors to 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 use in terms to to determine what developmental stage a person is at but i think that what is important is that we we think more about this time or age variable Unless we're only interested in description, then you know it's not a problem to just use age. But if we're interested really in what you know what triggers development and and how is development in one area related to development in another area, we really have to think much more about how how this process could be conceptualized, and then also how can can we model it in in turn to to actually yeah find out whether our uh, way of thinking about it actually makes sense and and, and uh, agrees with with the empirical data, but I think this is really a yeah. huge challenge. Yeah. Thank you very much. Indeed, this is a, a long question. We, I think we could go on for quite some time now, uh, but unfortunately, we have uh, to come to an end uh, with the session today. And so, I would like to open the floor for the last question, which is by Ulman Lindenberger. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so, Alan, first, thanks for a wonderful presentation and, and a great discussion that I think brought really out the complexity of, of studying uh, change. Um, my question follows up, in a way, on Andrea Hasel's last question and also on Marco's question. So I think your, your talk really invites to asking the, the difficult questions because you put them on the table. So you had this one fam fabulous quote from uh, uh, Baltus et al. where they say that we should think of these between person differences that we often even tend to call stable between person di uh, uh, differences as a cumulative product of earlier between person differences in change. So in a way yeah. that that's really a radical statement because it means that all these between person differences that we observe might have a developmental origin. Uh, and and the, the 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 concern I have is that if we now look at lead lag effects within persons detrending uh, uh, these effects or accounting for stable between person differences, that we then get some small waves, so to say, we get the little ripples on the on the ocean. But these little ripples will never get us to answering the question of why people ended up being so different from one another in the first place. That is, I, I wonder whether the, the, the promise of the measurement burst design really was met by the data and, and how can we better bridge the gap between making within-person observations and within-person little models on the one hand 
and understanding eventually between person differences in the long term over years and decades rather than weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an excellent question. Um, it's definitely something that I've uh, uh, also, yeah, sometimes fall asleep with this uh, this thought. Um, um, it's it's definitely. It, it, I think one okay one approach that you could take if you have this measurement burst design is of course that you say okay I have my within model for within each measurement burst, but then uh, there's stability within a, a measurement burst. And that's a new level. So um, I think uh, it was Neelam Ram and others who have this paper where they relate all these, uh, they, they have a measurement burst design and they are looking at the beep level nested within the day level, nested within the burst level, nested in the persons. So that's one approach that you could take and, and that I think um, might to some extent um, help to see that yes, there are these these little ripples, but then there's also um, an organization at higher levels. Um, yet, even if we would use a, an approach like this at the person level, we would still have these stable between person differences. So I think uh, the ideal would be that we actually start to measure from conception because then, uh, but how do we measure intelligence at conception or how do we measure neuroticism or, or other uh, like characteristics that we are interested in, in how they develop, how do these trade levels come about. Um, so I think that's, that it's impossible to do. But even if we could do a thought experiment, um, I think it would be interesting to think, of, like, okay, there's no differences at conception. And then at some point, yeah, the, the difference start to emerge and then they start to grow. And that's, that's something that we should be able to catch with a particular model. Um, um, uh, and I think uh, there are some people, of course, also very um, um, uh, enthusiastic about uh, the, the uh, continuous time model and differential equations and saying that, hey, you can have these long run uh, developmental trends as well as the little ripples uh, explained or, or even uh, generated by a simple set of equations. Um, personally, I, I'm, I'm less... Um, less enthusiastic about this because I don't think it's going to be a simple set of equations. And I think that the process, even because we have this thing of the experiencing self versus the remembering self, and I think the remembering self is very important actually. So it's it's um, it's the way that we reconstruct our, our life stories and how we construct the, the, the stories about ourselves. And I think that is also a very important aspect of how we experience life and how we approach life. So I, I think that um, um, just going to the smallest possible uh, time scale and then trying to generate from there to the larger time scales is not going to be the, 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 the best way to approach this. Um, I know there's also work where they uh, uh, where they say, yeah, even when you think about a trait like uh, narcissism or neuroticism, it's when you look at the description, it's very much about how people um, uh, respond at momentary at the momentary level. It's like how they interpret uh, uh, a comment of another person or how they interpret certain uh, uh, stressors in life. So I do think that there is uh, this this idea that these are completely separate worlds, which we could model completely separate, you know, with a multi-level approach might not be the best way to do it either. So I think, yeah, there it's it's um, it's actually, yeah, the major question I think uh, about development is how are the different time scales related to each other and how is development in one area related to development in another area? So we don't want to take out the trends because then we're just left with some ripples around the trends. But how can we relate the trends in a sensible way to each other if it's not just the correlation between the trends, what we get with the latent growth curve model? I think it's uh, it's. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's something that we can definitely uh, engage ourselves with for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, especially you, uh, Ellen, for a very insightful presentation and a thought-provoking discussion. Uh, it, it, it was a great pleasure to host you here in, uh, in our session today. Thank you, uh, Yannick, Lisa, and uh, also Andrea, our fellows, for contributing to the success of this session. 
Uh, with this, I want to, to end the session for today and I would like to invite you to uh, join us for our last session in this year's uh, live theory lab uh, next week uh, at uh, 4 p.m. Um, European time. Uh, we will have Ulmer Lindenberger as our uh, guest speaker. Thank you very much and uh, see you hopefully next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.